We Thought We Knew Her is a true crime book written by M. William Phelps, focusing on the case of Katie Conroy and how Katie came to be found guilty of poisoning her boyfriend's mom, Mary Yoder, in upstate New York in 2017. M. William Phelps is an amazing true crime writer, New York Times bestselling author, and he is the executive producer, writer, and host of the number one true crime podcast franchise, Paper Ghosts, and Crossing the Line with M. William Phelps an ongoing weekly podcast diving deeply into murder, missing people, and unsolved cold cases rarely covered. Mary Yoder and William Yoder met in 1975 in college and were married for 28 years. They were partners in a wellness and chiropractor family practice office in upstate New York and had three grown children. Mary and William shared responsibilities at the family practice office and worked together and some opposite hours. They were nearing a time in their lives when they needed to slow down a bit. William began cutting back on his hours and they had a bucket list trip planned for the fall that they were both really looking forward to. Mary was a devoted chiropractor who loved her clients and often bartered with them in lieu of cash payment. Mary was also a rep and advocate for Shackley and used their protein powders and supplements on a daily basis. She was active and vibrant, loved in the community, and was very healthy for a 60-year-old woman. The youngest son and child is Adam. Adam was still finding himself and was in and out of college. During high school in his early days, Adam ran the office at their family practice. Adam was responsible and mature and great with the day-to-day details of the office and its patients. Unfortunately, Adam also suffered from depression and low self-esteem. Around 2012, Adam met Caitlin Conley. Caitlin is a beautiful, fun, sweet, and comes from a great family and a family of means. Caitlin at the time was perfect. Adam and Caitlin hit it off and fall madly in love very soon, but like a lot of young loves, there were issues. Their relationship became on and off again. There were fights, breakups, and makeups. Through hundreds of texts acquired by the police, Adam and Katie's relationship was extremely volatile and often included the most hateful and angry written text exchanges on both sides. This became a very dysfunctional, codependent and toxic relationship. During this time, Adam convinced his parents to hire Katie as the receptionist at the chiropractor office so he could devote his time to school. Eventually, Adam and Katie broke up for what some would like to think for good, while Katie maintained her job at the family practice. Adam tried to continue a friendship with Katie, but even that seemed very difficult. Katie accused Adam of rape and then rescinded when confronted with making a statement to the police. The details of this and hundreds of texts of this dysfunctional relationship are way too much to expand on here, but you can find out more by reading M. William Phelps' book, We Thought We Knew Her, or checking out the YouTube video in the description below. A&E's Mysterious Murder of a Beloved 60-Year-Old Chiropractor, Season 15, Episode 2. In spring of 2015, during an on-time, Katie provided Adam with supplements to help him concentrate for finals and be less tired. After only taking one supplement, Adam became very sick. Adam was not sure of what happened and was very ill for days. In this time, Katie continued to encourage Adam to take the supplements to feel better. As sick as Adam was, he did not take them anymore or anything else and let the so-called illness run its course. On July 20th, 2015, Mary went to work at her chiropractic office as usual. She began feeling ill around lunchtime. This was the time when she usually had her protein shake. She assumed she had a stomach bug and probably the same one that Adam had had recently. She went home early from work and continued to be sick with vomiting, diarrhea, extreme gastro pain and distress, and an awful headache. She spent the night on the couch near the bathroom and continued to be sick. When her husband William woke up in the morning and found her gravely ill on the couch, he took her to the emergency room. A series of tests were given and Mary was put on an IV to get her hydrated. That day and into the evening were uneventful but Mary did not seem to be rallying or getting any better. Eventually, William left for the night to return first thing in the a.m. William was awoken to banging on his door. The hospital had had been trying to get in touch with him. 
Mary and Bill had a habit of charging their phones in another room at night so as not to be woken, and it is assumed that force of habit had Bill leave his phone in the other room that night as well as Mary lay in the hospital. He was instructed to get to the hospital right away, that Mary had been taken a turn for the worst and was now in ICU. Bill called his three children and headed for the hospital. In a bit of lucky coincidence, Mary and Bill's daughter, Liana, is a doctor and was able to get many more details from Mary's doctors of her mom's condition. As the children and Bill sat near Mary in ICU and prayed, Mary slipped away and died within 24 hours of feeling sick, leaving her family shocked and devastated. The doctors, Bill and Leanna, all thought it was a great idea and a very much needed idea to have an autopsy performed. How does a healthy, energetic, 60-year-old woman get sick and die within 24 hours? Mary's autopsy was thorough and investigated for common poisons, including cyanide and arsenic. In another series of coincidences, a poison control expert suggested that Mary be tested for colchicine, a medication used to treat painful conditions such as gout. When this drug is being taken, it has to be in very, very small and accurate doses. And if it's taken in incorrectly, it can be highly toxic. Colchicine has what is called a narrow therapeutic index which means that the window between a therapeutic dose and a fatal one is very small. Colchicine is also widely used to enhance crop growth. It was discovered that Mary had in fact not only been poisoned by colchicine, but enough agricultural grade colchicine in her to kill her 15 times over. Upon this revelation, a murder investigation was officially opened. Of course, the first person to be looked at and investigated was Bill. Bill was very cooperative, and it was proven that he had nothing to do with his wife's death. The investigation was stalling until four months later when an anonymous phone call was received and an anonymous letter was received by the police. The anonymous letter shifted the focus to Adam. As part of investigating Adam, Katie was brought in for questioning. Through Katie's actions, cell phone records, and forensics, the puzzles began to fall into place. The colchicine purchase was traced to the IP address at the family practice office. The colchicine was purchased with gift cards from a local store purchased by someone matching Katie's description. The anonymous letter was written on a computer at the chiropractic office. The gift cards that were used to purchase the colchicine were purchased from an IP address at the family practice office. When Adam's truck was searched, a bottle of colchicine was found under the seat, but instead of having Adam's DNA on it, it had Katie's DNA. Katie was soon arrested and put on trial in May of 2017 with what was a very circumstantial basket of evidence. Circumstantial evidence is still evidence, but often harder for juries to make sense of. This trial ended in a hung jury. Assistant District Attorney Lori Lisi decided to retry Caitlin. During trial prep and re-interviewing Adam, it was learned that Adam had a complete backup of Katie's phone on his computer. Apparently, Katie had connected her phone to Adam's computer at some point to download a book or podcast, only to have her phone completely backed up to Adam's computer. Although asking Adam several times to delete that backup, Adam never did. Through extreme investigative expertise, Stacy Scotty of the DA's office found a treasure trove of information on this backup, practically a diary and step-by-step -step of how to poison someone with colchicine. Stacy Scotty tracked every web page, email, e-note, and keystroke on Katie's phone backup, creating a very detailed and sequential timeline. With the help of computer forensics expert and director of the Northeast Cyber Forensics Center at Utica College, Anthony Martino, who spent more than a day on the stand, Caitlin Conley was found guilty of manslaughter in the first degree on November 16, 2017, and was sentenced to 23 years in jail. While many still believe in Caitlin's innocence and continue fighting her for release, she will not be eligible for parole until 2037. 
Caitlin's legal team has filed for appeals, but they have all been denied. I continue to be one of these people who do not believe in Katie's innocence. Join me next Saturday for the next chapter of Canvas and Crime Chronicles. And if you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, please do.